if you have questions or comment, feel free to jump in and ask them. Um, so the three of us, we're from a company called Pivot Bio. It's based in the US. And if it's possible, I'm gonna share my screen and just show a short two minute video from our website. So you have an idea of what the company does. So let's see if I can do that. Um, So how does that look? Do people see trees right now? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, yes. great. So I'm just, I'm just going to play this video from our website. Just breathe. It's the essence of life. Every breath can give us energy, joy, and peace. Oxygen supports so much of our life, yet makes up precious little of our atmosphere. Almost 80% of the air is actually nitrogen. In the right form, it is one of the building blocks of life for humans, animals, and plants. The crops we grow rely on tiny microbes in the soil that turn nitrogen from the air into life. It's biology at its finest. As human life flourished and food production increased, our soils weren't able to keep up. So farmers relied on the only tool available, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, to feed us all. Without it, half of the world's food supply would not exist. Yet synthetic nitrogen's massive scale is on an earth-altering course, accounting for 2% of all greenhouse gas emissions. This chemical process pulls nitrogen out of the air and transforms it into fertilizer with almost half never reaching the crops it was intended to fertilize. Nitrogen ends up in our waterways, contributing to dead zones in our oceans and lakes. Synthetic nitrogen has also had an unintended impact on our soils. The microbes stopped converting nitrogen into fuel to help grow our crops. Faced with the challenge that we must produce 50% more food by 2050, our future urgently needs a better way and farmers deserve a better nitrogen right now. We are at a turning point. Pivot Bio has introduced a revolutionary biological product that harnesses nature's ability to deliver plant-ready nitrogen without the negative side effects of synthetic fertilizer. By empowering farmers to grow crops in a better way, we'll boost farmer productivity, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve air and water quality, and help sustainably feed our growing global population. By using our microbes on just half of the corn, wheat, and rice crops around the world, we'd have the power to reduce emissions equivalent to planting 16 billion trees, all by changing the way we deliver nitrogen to plants. This is nitrogen's turning point. Just breathe. Okay, so I think you don't see my screen anymore. Is that true? Okay, great. Um, so that's the very polished corporate video. But basically what our company does is we make microbes that feed plants nitrogen. And the idea is to replace synthetic chemical fertilizer that's made in factories and causes a lot of pollution. I'll stop there. Did anybody have any questions about that part so far? Great. So the, the people that are on the call today, myself, Ada, and Steve, um, we all work on a team together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share one slide that gives an example of our work. And then I think the three of us will introduce ourselves and talk about um, how our work relates to the company and data science and data engineering. So let me just show you this one slide to explain specifically in the company kind of what our team does. I'll share my screen again.
Oh, shoot. Let me just go back. We'll have to, we'll just start here. Um, we're just looking at one slide. Do people see um, some pictures and graphics? Yes, we do. Thank you. I appreciate that. So on our team, we're very involved at looking at the data that comes back from cornfields. And in the US, there's a lot of commercial farming where it mo almost all of the corn and wheat is planted with huge machines. So here what we have, this is actually a picture of a cornfield from above. And maybe there's probably a house or something here in that white spot. But the rest of this is actually a map of the harvest, the yield that that field produced. So where it's dark, there was less maize that was grown. And where it's light, there was more maize that was grown, right? And so this is measured by a machine that's running through the field. It harvests the corn and it has sensors that are measuring how much corn it picks up at every point. So our challenge as a company is, you know, we're making microbes that increase the plant health, but we have to be able to test how well are the microbes working? Are there some microbes that work better than others? And some of you might have done some lab work before or done some experiments where you use a control. You know, if I have one part of the field just with plain corn, how does that compare to another part of the field with microbes growing on it? If the microbes are good, you would expect to see better plant health, better maize, better harvest, right? But out in the real world, it's never that clear because, so in this field, you can see this was planted by a machine. It was basically planted by a robot. Everything was planted by a robot. But you could see there's a lot of variability in the field for the harvest, and there's a low spot here. Now, the question is, was that low spot a part of the field, or was it caused by our treatment? Did the microbes actually make that part worse? Or conversely, you could also ask, okay, this spot, it's doing really well. Is that, does that spot always perform really well in the field? Like there's something about the soil or the water there, or is it our microbes that are making it better? And so you could, you could see, we talk a lot about signal and noise. There's a lot of noise in here. And a lot of what our team does is try to find a better signal. So, um, so in this case, this is one of the graphics that Steve put together that I love. Um, and basically the idea is like, you know, maybe this blue, these blue bars are one treatment and the orange bars are another treatment. And this curvy line is sort of the environmental effects. It's the soil, it's the water, it's like the insects in that part of the field. And that's, there's so much noise that it can mask which treatment is better than the other, right? So even though the orange treatment is stronger, it actually looks worse because of the environment. If you put that orange treatment on a low spot in the field, it would look worse than the blue one, which is actually weaker. So a lot of the work that we do is trying to figure out how can we approximate the field effects, right? So that we can try to remove it from our models. And in that way, you know, um, you know I, in an ideal world, <laughs> this is just a cartoon, but then, you know, this, this blue product has a smaller effect, the orange project has a larger effect, and we'd actually be able to see that after we remove the environmental variability. Um, are there any questions about this? It's really quiet here. Anyone has any questions? Uh, same, Blaze, go on. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Blaze, go on. Okay, I did see the part where you talked about the environmental uh, effect and how it affected how the control and the, and the place we had the microbes. I really didn't understand what the environment, how you did get the environmental effect out of it. Yeah, the answer is it's complicated and we're trying a lot of things. That's really our goal um, to remove that environmental effect. But like, for example, some of the things that we try are using soil maps 
um, can soil maps account for some of the variability? Um, I know the challenge that you're working on is about the elevation in the field, because that can predict which parts of the field are wet or dry. So also thinking about water flow in the field. Um, we've looked at historical satellite data for the field. And we've also worked on some methods that are more purely mathematical, like spatial autoregression, um, to just pull it out from the spatial patterns, what is happening. Um, and we, we, don't, we don't have the perfect answer yet. Like, we're still working on it. Mm, OK, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Great. So I will I'll I'll pass it to Steve to introduce yourself and how your work relates to the company. And then after that, Ada, you can talk about yourself also. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Al. Hey everybody. Um, my name is Steve Fick. I work with Laura um, at Pivot Bio. I've been there about a year. Uh, my background is I, my background is a, an ecology, um, and so it's been really interesting to learn about ag and basically doing data science in ag. Um, so I work primarily on kind of the stuff that I'll just just mentioned right now, um, a lot of what we do is try to determine what products are going to be good and uh, good performers and things that we want to sell. So we're constantly trying new products. We have a big component of our company, which is just in the laboratory, finding new microbes, testing them out, seeing how well they can produce nitrogen altering them. Then we have another stage that's in the greenhouse. So after we screen candidates from the lab, we move them to the greenhouse and test them in plants and also see how well they perform there. And then so what, what we work on is sort of the final stage of that. So all the microbes that have passed those initial filters um, finally get out into the field. And that's the real test. So you can imagine how different the environment is in a field versus a greenhouse or in a field versus um, the lab. So not only do you have the different effects of the soils and the microbe communities in the soils, but you also have things like different farmers having different management practices, um, all sorts of things that can go wrong when you actually try to put the microbe in the field. Um, and so there's a lot more variability when we were looking at the data, um, which is why it's it's so important for the company to try to tease apart the, as Elle said, the signal, how are the microbes doing compared to the noise, which is the environmental background, all these things that can go wrong, um, all these things that you're not even measuring that are changing um, what the yield is in a different part of the field. And so really what we focus on is helping our decision makers make better decisions about moving a candidate strain or a, a microbe further in their, our production process. Um, and that can be pretty stressful, I'd say, because um, it tends to be a pretty important decision for the business. Uh, but it's also exciting because you really feel like you're um, you're helping, you're helping make good decisions. Um, one thing I'll note about what the work looks like day to day, which is probably relevant for what you guys are studying is that, um, you know, it's been said before that data science is like 80% data preparation and 20% actual analysis. Um, I'd say that's true and maybe even, even more percent data prep. Um, so, there is a need just in general, pretty much probably any data science team for uh, really good processes and workflows to, to make the data prep side more efficient, more reproducible, faster, more effective for, for analysis. And I'd say that's pretty true in our team as well. 
Um, do you guys have any questions? I see there's one question. Um, how do you test nitrogen content? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there's no single way. I mean, one of the ways that we have been relying on for our experiments last year was actually going into the field, selecting a few corn plants and cutting, cutting them down entirely, drying them out, grinding them up, and then sending them to a, a laboratory where they're tested, their, their chemical competition is tested. Um, this is something that is, uh, it's, it's a really good baseline because it's, it, there's no better real measurement. However, it's really painful to collect the data because if you've ever walked in a, a cornfield after a certain stage, it's over your head and it's hot and confusing and uh, miserable. So we want to try to find new ways to measure nitrogen actually um, that don't involve a lot of painful labor like that. So we're looking into using uh, remote sensing imagery, satellites, and drone imagery to see if we can quantify nitrogen in plants using basically uh, spectral or what they look like from, from the air. Um, so that's a great question. And then there's other, there's other ways that we're also approaching this problem. Ella is working on one right now um, using a combination of fresh weight, so fresh weight of the plant and um, basically greenness or CCIL, you could probably explain it better. Um, but, well, there's, there's, um, so one of the, there's a handheld sensor that you can clip to a leaf. It shines a light through the leaf and it measures what percentage of the leaf, what, what types of light are getting through the leaf. And it's a way of measuring greenness because you can measure like basically how much of um, the red spectrum is getting through, right? Because the red is absorbed in a green leaf. And uh, when you do that, you can make an estimate. CCI stands for chlorophyll concentration index. And so that gives you an estimate of how much chlorophyll is in that leaf. And then theoretically, the more chlor chlorophyll the leaf has, the greener it is, the healthier it is, and the more nitrogen it has inside the plant. So we have um, actually some of our salespeople this season, when they went out to go talk to customers and evaluate our product in the field, they were taking this handheld meter and measuring in parts of the field where there was microbes and not in order to um, show the customer if there was a difference there. So that's that's a different way that we also estimate or try to measure nitrogen in plants. Adam, so, would you like, oh yeah. Or, yeah, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. I'll just go ahead and apologize for the noise. There's no background noise cancellation in Jimmy, so I'm sorry. Uh, so my name is Ada Kibat and I'm an alumni of Chen Academy. I was here last year, batch three, and uh, my background is in maths and computer science. Uh, so I joined Pivot about six months ago, February. So, and L Laura is my manager. So what I do mostly is, I'd say, the data engineering tasks, uh, kind of to make Steve's and L's life easier when interacting with the data sets that they need for the for the research and analysis that they're doing. So I already had a session with them, Al and Steve, so I think that's introduction enough for me. So I'll just pass it back to you. Great. So I think the other thing I'd mentioned about your work, Ada, is you're working a lot with geospatial data types, which is a part of the 10 Academy challenge this week. And that's something that Ada learned on the job when she joined us, which was great. Like um, just being able to work with different tools and Python modules and QGIS. So um, yeah, I think I, I just like to highlight that from my own personal experience, the stuff I, I learned in school doesn't directly apply to the job I do now. And I think it's one of the most important skills anybody can have is being able to join a team and 
learn quickly about um, the different tools the team uses. So um, I think Ada, you're doing an awesome job at that. And I just wanted to give you a shout out for that. So thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. So my name is Elle. It's, it's short for Laura. I, I prefer to go by my first initial. And I'm a data science product manager, which is a lot of big words. It basically means that I like understanding both the technical side of an analysis or models that we use or the data cleaning, but I also like understanding the user side. You know, who are the customers who are going to be using the data and what do they need to know from it? They, uh, and being able to translate between both those worlds because they might not care about what linear model we used or how we clean our data, <laughs> technical details that are very important. They might care about something that's very different. And so um, I really like thinking about both sides of these worlds. And I guess the example right now is the CCI meter example we gave you. It's actually not technically the most, it's not even close to being the most precise tool we have for measuring corn in a field, the nitrogen content. But the advantage we have there is the interaction with the customer. Like somebody, somebody comes to your field and they show you real time what's going on. And that's much more powerful for the customer than having some fancy analysis. Like in the past, we have taken samples, cut them down from the field, sent them to the lab, and then sent a report back. That whole process can take a month. And by the time a month has passed, like the customer's thinking about something else. And so, um, yeah, for me, it's interesting to think about trade-offs like that. In this case, it's, it's a trade-off between, I guess, between precision and connection. You have an opportunity when you're in the field with the customer. Um, yeah, and so um, that's, that's a little bit about me. My, my, my background's pretty different. I actually studied, um, I studied neuroengineering in undergrad, uh, bioengineering, and then I spent a lot of my career working on um, renewable energy systems in Ghana, Kenya, and Rwanda. And a lot of that was waste energy. Um, and then just very recently, about two years ago, I joined Pivot Bio. Um, mostly because of, I like the idea of working on a challenge that can um, reduce environmental harm and has a big chance of um, helping to combat climate change by the amount of nitrogen pollution, pollution that we aspire to leave. We, we're not there yet, but that's, that's, that's the vision. Um, are, there any, are there any questions about anything? that we've said so far or anything that I've said. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, um, uh, OK. Um, my question is about what sort of data you deal with. I mean, you, may, you mentioned something really um, brilliant to the leaf thing. Um, so I'm asking what kind of data do you get in that particular scenario where you're passing light through a leaf and maybe from the drones? And I mean, in this particular challenge, we're sort of interacting with the LIDAR. So just asking. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a couple, there's a couple, yeah, we work with a lot of different types of data types. So one was, I showed you kind of a picture of machine data, like the sensors on the machine that come back and say, this is how much corn I harvested in different parts of the field. Um, and that usually comes back like as a shape file, basically, or like the, the geospatial point file. Um, we, yeah, we do work with drones and satellite. And the main information that we're using that right there now is basically the different bandwidths of light and in different, um, and use it. There's simple calculations, but the two most common ones are NDVI and NDRE. I don't remember what they stand for, but they're, um, they just use like NDRE, for example, uses red edge, the red edge bandwidth. Um, and they give us an estimation of the plant health. Like basically the higher the number is, kind of the same concept, like the higher the number is, the greener the plant is, and so the healthier it is. Um, and so like the UAV information usually comes back in geotiffs and in rasters. Um, and then for the handheld, 
the, the other type of data is these like handheld things or somebody where someone's manually going to the field. So for example, they can go to a plot and cut down three plants and send it to the lab. Uh, we've just recently started geotagging those samples so we know where they came from in the field. Like before we had a general idea it was from plot 101, but plot 101 could be like half an acre. It could be pretty big or even larger than an acre. Um, and so now we're working on, those are more discrete points. Like we don't have the full raster, we don't have the full field. We just have, but it's very precise, right? We cut that plant, they dry it, send it to the lab and we get precise information back rather than like an estimate from um, UAV or from satellite. And so, and then the, the challenge that, they, that you all are working this, on with this week, LIDAR. LIDAR is very interesting for us because another part of, plant health is the plant biomass. How big is the plant, basically? Um, it, we're, we're finding more and more the story is not just how green is the plant, but how big is the plant. Like a bigger, greener plant produces more maize. And we don't, so LIDAR is interesting because it can help us estimate the volume of plants in a whole field. And I know that in the challenge you're working on, it's more about this high resolution LIDAR that gives us a sense of the elevation in the field. Um, rather than the plants themselves. Um, Steve or Ada, do you have other pieces that I missed? I think that's it. I mean, there's um, there's some members of our team who work more on lab data and that's a whole other kind of set of measurements. Um, we do have some some work measuring stable isotopes of nitrogen so if you've ever um, worked with that stuff, you know that um, like certain elements have different numbers of neutrons uh, in their atoms. Um, and in the nature, there's this, you know, uh, there's common ratios, like there's a, uh, most nitrogen is, uh, I think N15. And anyway, there's, there's ways to tell um, how much nitrogen has been fixed given the ratio of the different, uh, basically nitrogen isotopes. And so that's, that's one other type of data that we're looking at. Um, but that's also coming in sort of as a tabular, tabular readout from a lab. Uh, I guess there's also the, the soil attributes data, but I think that's connected to the geo data because you need the the rasters of a ship file to pull those from the database. But yeah, so the attributes. Great. So I see there's another question. Um, Steve or Ada, would you be interested in answering? How do you rank different features you collect from the data and identify ones to use and drop? a great question. In a, I think you've, you've done a little bit of this with some of our analyses. Um, it's a great data science question, really. And it, of course, depends on the problem. But um, I can say one, one way that um, we've done this recently um, is using lasso regression. So we have another data product that we use, which is, uh, it's called soil optics. Basically, these guys go out to a field <clears throat> before planting, and then they, they drive a little car across it in, in a sort of in rows and collect samples using a, a gamma radiation sensor. Uh, and then from, from these measurements, they make a sort of map of soil properties, spatial, spatial map of soil properties. Uh, and they come back with, you know, <clears throat> 40, 50 columns worth of features. And obviously those are too many relative to our um, observations, our, our like yield observations. So we do have to perform some variable selection on those. And most recently we've used um, tools like Lasso, but of course there's, you know, a whole portfolio of other things you can try.
Great. So the next question I see is for me, how did my background help me for my current position? Um, so I think one part of my path is I studied engineering in undergrad. And when I first enrolled in the school, I didn't want to be an engineer. I just liked the school so much and they only offered engineering degrees. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to get this degree and then I'm going to do something else. But I think what I realized in that school is that, in, like, I guess before that, when I was in, in high school, my impression of engineering was that it was about, like, designing bridges and building buildings, which seemed really boring to me. <laughs> but what I realized at the school, like, my second year there, I was like, oh, actually, engineering is just problem solving. It's being able to see a problem and maybe from different viewpoints, change the questions that I'm asking, change the approaches that I'm taking and see if we can get closer to a solution. And so after that, after my second year, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be an engineer. This is great. It's really fun and exciting. But I think that broader view of engineering, for me, I feel like I can apply those skills in any situation. And actually the, the school I went to was very good at this. It was like an experimental college um, and so they didn't have, we didn't do a lot of work out of textbooks. Instead, they would give us product projects that we had no idea what to do. Maybe very similar to your, your challenges. Like maybe the first time you read it, it seems confusing and maybe overwhelming. Um, and so they would say, program this micro prick to do this thing. And, that, and at that point, I remember walking to the class and being like, I don't know what a micro pick is. I've never seen one before. I've never programmed anything before. And instead of giving us the instructions, they would coach us to ask the right questions to figure out how to do it. Um, and so I think that that training, basically just like the understanding of, like for me, engineering is problem solving and that can be applied basically anywhere. And also just like the troubleshooting and bootstrapping skills, like I don't know what this means. What's the first step I can take to get closer to knowing what that means? or this is not working. How do I find one piece of this to test to understand why it's not working? And so I think those skills I use every single day, <laughs> even if um, I, I laugh a lot because there was a lot of advanced like calculus and physics and all this stuff. I don't remember any of that, honestly, like, uh, you know, what is it? It's like 20 years later, maybe not 20, 15 years later. Um, I don't remember any of that. And it just impresses me because I spent so much time and attention learning it at the time. But really, 15 years later, what remains with me is like those troubleshooting skills and, and bootstrapping, bootstrapping knowledge. Um, so the next question, the LIDAR data contains elevation points, but I think you're more interested in the height of the vegetation. How does that relate to the elevation data? Do you want to take this one, Steve? Sure. Um, that's a really good question. So you probably noticed that um, the data you're working with is not really, <clears throat> it's not really about plant canopy height, which is something that we really, we really want. So, so the idea behind the data that, that you were working with was really about getting an estimate of the earth's surface to try to build a model for where water might collect or where water might leave and create a little dry spot. Um, we are interested in using LIDAR to measure vegetation height, and we're actually doing experiments this year um, with LIDAR based on drones. So we, we mount a LIDAR camera on a drone, fly it over a field. Uh, this involves, it's a little bit laborious because we have to come in before the crop is grown, before it's sown, to get a good model of the actual surface of the ground without any plants on it. And we have to come back later when the uh, corn is growing, fly it again, build another model that's just the top of the surface of the canopy. And then we, we subtract those two to get an estimate of the height at each point in the field. And so getting to that question, which is um, what we're finding is really important, right? Plant biomass is a little bit more laborious. It requires us going out and collecting data. 
Um, however, the data type is the same, and it's, you know, I'm curious actually to hear how, how this project is going right now because, uh, you know, we have specialists who collect this data and, um, you know, I personally haven't worked too much with LiDAR point cloud data, but it's really interesting to me. Um, I, I, used to, I just, before Barakat goes, I wanted to ask, is that like a mathematical model already that like associates the canopy height to an elevation or TWI? Because I saw that was the main focus of the challenge. So what what's the path that you're taking from LIDAR to canopy height? Um, so that's, so that's, Crockett on our team, maybe you probably know know him, but um, it's it's I think a, a pretty simple subtract subtraction. So you, you just take a point um, in a, in a given field, find the canopy height, and then find that where that same point lies on your surface model, and take the difference of the two. If I'm understanding your qu your question correctly. And then, and then, in, in order to get these derived metrics of like um, topograph, there like a water flow or things like that. That's that's a different process of extracting topographic indices from the shape of the the surface. And there's a whole number of algorithms and ways to do that. Oh, uh, yeah, that answers it. Thank you. So I know we just have five minutes left and there were two other questions that Arun posed to me to, to give a little bit of context. So I'm just going to make sure to answer those. Um, one was it, they're about the challenge that you're working on. And one of the questions was, is this like a cutting edge challenge or is it like bread and butter in the industry um, working with this LIDAR data? And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let Steve chime in in a minute because he knows much more about this than what than I do, I think, about what the industry uses. But that LiDAR point cloud is fairly new. I think they just released it a year ago or so. And so I think for me, this is a cutting edge project because there are, there are potentially other companies that are looking at it, but I they wouldn't have had much time to develop like products or analyses around it. Um, and and our, in our team, it's not it's not a data set we've ever worked with. One of the reasons why we proposed it be, was was um, it was like this is a really cool data set. We wish we could interact with it, you know. But we're doing so many other things. Like it just seems like um, this this could be potentially very useful. Do you have other thoughts about that, Steve? Yeah, yeah, just totally echoing what you said, though, and also that this data set it's you know so rich. Um, it's used used in other other industries as well. I mean, if you, I don't know if you've taken a look at the lidar data for like a city or something, but you can actually make out shapes of structures. So there's applications in real estate and all kinds of um, commercial endeavors with this data as well. So it's widely applicable, but obviously incredibly large and uh, a little bit unwieldy to deal with, which I thought was one of the interesting data aspects of the data um, engineering challenge. Great. So we've got three minutes left. I'm a little bit torn because there's so many questions and one person with their hand raised. Um, in order to be fair, I'm going to jump to the questions in the chat because I think they were asked first. And we'll just go for the next three minutes and see what we can get through. Maybe we'll do, try to do a lightning round. Um, oh, there's two. So how is yield per area collected? I'm going to share my screen real quick um, and show this to you. So do you see, um, do you see like farm machinery, basically? A picture of farm machinery? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in the US, it's very common. You have these two huge machines. The first one is running through the field, picking up all the corn, tearing off the leaves, tearing the the maize off the cob and it, it throws the rest of the biomass back onto the field behind it and just the maize cob gets dumped out. So it's a very sophisticated machine 
and it's got sensors everywhere in it that's measuring like the moisture content and the volume and the weight. And so you can imagine as this machine runs up and down the field, it's making a map of where it collected more or less data. So that's one quick answer. Let's see, what's the, the next one? How do you mitigate external factors that you can't really determine or quantify, like people's action from the analysis? That is such an excellent question. <laughs> my, my, my first response is like, the gold standard is to talk to the grower, like the farmer. They obviously have the most information about their field. They know, oh, the, the deer came in and ate that corner. Or, oh, we used to have a farmhouse there, but then we tore it down. And that's why there's a weird square in the middle of the field, because the soil is very different there. Do you have other thoughts about that, Steve? Yeah, the, the other thing we do is do a lot of replication. So we mm. try not to put all our eggs in one basket, one type of um, experiment. And then to the, to the extent possible, we, we try to get a lot of different growers to do it. And so hopefully the true signal um, comes out. There was one person with their hand raised. Are they still here? But that's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Right, that you can unmute. Maybe his mic is not working. Maybe maybe type it in that case. But it's really great. Like I think it's um, maybe if you have one minute, someone can tell you how the project is going. I don't know if they have already. Uh, told you that? No, so. I would. It would be very interesting to hear that from okay. someone's experience about the project so far. So, who wants to unmute and get the status, like an uh, update on the status of where you are and how you felt about the project? Maybe Milky, given that you have asked more, more than anyone. <laughs> Okay. Anyone else? Maybe Al, you can choose randomly. Yeah. You're muted. You're muted. Uh... Okay, I'm going to choose man randomly. And I'll say that your prizes, you'll get good karma. Something nice will happen to you if you tell us about how the project is going. So um, I see a person called Seshi Kivika. Can, yeah. you, can you give us? Uh, hi, everyone. Hey. Uh, hi I there. started the project on Monday. And uh, yeah, it was confusing with a lot of jargon and uh, trying to understand the data. So now I understand what uh, LIDAR data is, how it's collected, and how it's stored. So, so far, I've been able to uh, get the data from uh, AWS and uh, also create a pipeline to read the kind of data that is stored there. And then uh, I've also been able to extract the, the elevations and uh, latitudes and longitudes and put them in a data frame. So currently what I'm trying to do is trying to visualize that elevation. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to do that also. Great, that makes sense. Thanks for mentioning the jargon. I think it's, I think it's really common in any field. Like we're using these terms all the time, every day, and so we forget that we might be only like the 0.5 percent of the population that uses those words. But that that makes sense, and I'm it, I'm glad that you were able to figure out what those terms meant. And I'd say that the experience of sort of encountering a data type that you don't really know about and you have to learn about is fairly common and there's just a lot of reading documentation involved <laughs> in this job 
So <laughs> if you want to do it, get used to it. <laughs> I think uh, Great. how to read the documentation is a type of skill. Yeah. How do you get yes. Scheme and get what you want and work exactly. Exactly. That, yeah. Not all. Yeah. You definitely don't want to read all of the documentation. But yeah. Yeah. Just enough. Cool. Since we just have one last question, I'll answer that, and I think we can close the yeah. session. Um, so, Barakat, it sounds you have a really excellent question about how will we mitigate the problem of generalizing the solution to more places, generalizing the microbe. And so we actually do this in our trial design and analysis. Basically, data from one location is useless to us because every location is different. Um, when we choose a product that we decide to sell to our customers, we're testing it on hundreds of locations. And the reason why is you, you can have a product or microbes that are rock stars at one location, they're really pumping it out, but another location, they completely fail. And for us, that's not acceptable. We'd rather have a product that's consistently good rather than like a rock star at one location and awful at another. So we really take into consideration the consistency between different sites across the US on how the microbes perform. Um, that matters a lot to us. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for, thanks everyone for joining us. It's been really, Nice spending this time with you and good luck with the challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Dara. Thanks, Adanta. Thanks, Steve. It's really eye opening. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Well, we